Credence from the Mark signing on, continuing the course on the history of Catholicism in the United States with the next installment of the 1870s, bringing us to the centennial year of 1876, counting from the Declaration of Independence rather than the later federal constitution. It was a presidential election year, and only the second such election in our history to be legally questionable with allegations of corruption and subversion of the people's right to vote. The previous such election, condemned as a corrupt bargain, was that of 1824. In that election, which we covered earlier in the course, John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, <clears throat> was elected president on February 9th, 1825, after the election was decided by the House of Representatives in his favor over Andrew Jackson. The problem is that Andrew Jackson won the popular vote. Subsequently, Henry Clay, the speaker of the same House of Representatives that voted to give the election to Adams instead of the popular vote winner, Jackson, was appointed Secretary of State by the same John Quincy Adams, leading to the allegation of the corrupt bargain in which supposedly Clay rigged the House of Representatives vote uh, for a victory for Adams in exchange for the prestigious appointment as Secretary of State, which could have led to the presidency. <clears throat> uh, this election is notable for being the only time since the passage of the 12th Amendment in which the presidential election was decided by the House of Representatives um, as no candidate received a majority of the electoral vote because there were too many running. This presidential election was also uh, the only one in which the candidate receiving the most electoral votes did not become president because a majority, uh, not just a, plur a plurality, was required to win. It's also often said to be the first election in which a president did not win the popular vote, although the popular vote was not reliably counted in earlier elections, so that, that factoid is ambivalent. <clears throat> so that was the previous, you know, that was the first uh, questioned presidential election. So the centennial election of 1876 was the second. It was contested by Ohio Governor Rutherford B. Hayes for the Republicans against the governor of New York, Samuel Tilden, for the Democrats. Much of the debate during the election centered on the continued military occupation of the former Confederate states by federal troops. Uh, at this point, um, 11 years after the Civil War ended. The disputed election was decided in favor of Rutherford B. Hayes by a congressional commission, not by the full House of Representatives, making him president number 19. And as president, Hayes ended the occupation, or as the Northern has called it, Reconstruction. He withdrew the last federal troops from the South the following year, in 1877. Uh, the problem, among the many problems with this, uh, Tilden, the loser of the election, actually won more of the popular vote and won the electoral vote. He had 184 electoral votes against Hayes' 165, with 20 electoral votes in dispute. Those 20 electoral votes were from three states, former Confederate states, meaning still under occupation, Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. Each party in those states, 
Democrats and Republicans. They each reported that their candidate won the state. While another state that was not part of the Confederacy, the state of Oregon, uh, in, uh, one, of, one of their electors was declared illegal because he already held elected office, which is, it, and that's, it's stipulated that someone uh, that in elected office cannot serve, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but cannot serve as an elector in the Electoral College if they're still holding office. The 20 disputed electoral votes were ultimately awarded to Hayes after a bitter legal and political battle giving him victory. Some historians believe that a deal, another corrupt bargain, was struck to resolve the dispute, that, uh, such that in return for the Democrats and Tilden accepting Hayes's election and, and you know stop agitating about it. The Republicans agreed to withdraw federal troops from the South, ending Reconstruction. And wh- it, you know now whether whether that agreement you know how formal that agreement was or was it a handshake deal or was it an innuendo you know, nobody knows. But we but what is known is that the following year Hayes did withdraw federal troops and end Reconstruction. As the um, United States celebrated the centennial in Philadelphia in July, July 4th, uh, 1876, the president, Ulysses S. Grant, was nearing the end of his second term in office. He was uh, afflicted, his administration was afflicted with a, a myriad of scandals, uh, affecting high officials in his administration, uh, you know, people he trusted that he should not have trusted, I took advantage of him. Uh, and, but, uh, but Grant had been considering a third term, running for a third term, which would have been possible at that point because the Constitution did not prohibit it. The two terms were just a custom uh, in imitation of Washington. But because of all the scandals, Grant gave up the possibility of seeking a, a third term. So then attention turned to several other Republican politicians uh, at their nominating convention, which was in Ohio, uh, met in Cincinnati in June. The leading candidate when the convention opened was none other than Speaker of the House, James G. Blaine of Maine. Uh, He was uh, the guy who proposed that constitutional amendment. He was a a leader. He was a Republican. He opposed a third term for Grant because he wanted to be president instead of Grant. He was a uh, a rival of a New York senator, Roscoe Conkling, who was another Republican, uh, but of the Republican faction that supported a third term for Grant. Also considered was Indiana's, uh, a former Indiana governor, who at the time of the election was a senator, named Oliver Morton. He was a favorite of the radical Republicans who did not want to end Reconstruction. His name was Benjamin Bristow. Another under consideration was Grant's former Secretary of the Treasury, John's uh, John Hantraft, who was uh, governor of Pennsylvania, and Rutherford B. Hayes, you know, <laughs> who entered, uh, uh, he was a governor of, of Ohio, so he was a governor of the hosting state where the convention met. Uh, though at the time he was considered a favorite son candidate, not a serious, a serious arrival as some of these other guys. Uh, only because he was not as flamboyant as uh, as some. But he was a, a war hero. He was wounded four times in the Civil War. He was elected to Congress in 1864, served two terms in the House. After the war, he was elected governor twice, two-term governor of Ohio. And then he returned to civilian life. He, he went back to practicing law in Cincinnati. But he was persuaded to return 
to politics. And he ran for governor again in a third non-consecutive term in 1875, defeating a, a, a Democrat. So I was balloting at the Cincinnati Convention, the Centennial Convention, began on June 16th. Blaine of Maine had the initial lead. But as often happens, the guy who goes in the favorite, you know, ends up, I mean, it's a striking pattern, but often, uh, you know, ends up forgotten. Uh, But after six ballots, Blaine failed to get sufficient votes for the nomination. On the seventh ballot, that people started making deals and, and started to uh, change. So the supporters of, uh, of Morton, the uh, former Indiana governor, and Bristow, uh, um, Grant's, uh, who was the radical, the reconstructing Republican, and Roscoe Conkling's uh, New York delegation switched their votes. They had been supporting Blaine, but they switched to Hayes, making him the Republican nominee. So Rutherford Hayes' main opponent in the election would be the Democrat, Samuel Tilden, the governor of New York, who was a wealthy corporate attorney. Tilden had gained recognition in politics as a reformer. He played an important role in the prosecution and conviction of a corrupt New York City political boss, William Tweed. Tilden easily defeated the other candidates uh, for his party's nomination, who included another Union uh, Civil War hero, Winfield Scott Hancock. There were also other minor candidates uh, that, you know, third parties, the Greenback Party, and, you know, that, that, but they didn't, uh, you know, they did, they did not get the national recognition. Hayes and Tilden were competing for the electoral votes of 38 states. Colorado had been admitted to the Union in the summer of the centennial year, so it's called the centennial state. Well, I'll talk about Colorado next. Uh, During the election, Reconstruction still existed. There, There were contingents of federal troops still stationed in some former Confederate states. Uh, And Grant... President Grant had had fought and expended some political capital to keep those troops there in the South as white Southerners, including members of the Klan, uh, sought to undermine the the Northern goal of the Southern Reconstruction, uh, which was to incorporate the freed slaves uh, into into full uh, full civil civil life, you know, public life, uh, including the voting rights amendment of the 15th amendment during the election campaign the republicans used the the bloody shirt against tilden uh, because uh hayes had been wounded four times in the war whereas tilden had not served at all during the war to win uh given the numbers at the time a candidate needed 185 electoral votes in terms of the popular vote, Tilden received 4.2 million, so 50.92 percent. Hayes received 4 million, 47.92 percent. Hayes won his home state, Ohio, but only narrowly, even though he was governor. Um, uh, 50 percent, 50.2 percent against 49.1. As remember, Ohio was a border state. So there were many Southern sympathizers there. Uh, but there were also, you know, those who were Northern sympathizers. Overall, the um, it appeared, and uh, the New York Times, the newspaper of record, declared Tilden the winner with 184 electoral votes. Um, not me, excuse, and a winner in the sense of having the most electoral votes, 184, but that was just one short of becoming president-elect. Hayes had a 181 votes, but Florida's four electoral votes were in doubt. So this should have gone to the House of Representatives. There's a clear process in the Constitution that no matter how many candidates ran, in this case, there were like eight of them that were running, 
the top three vote getters would that would then go would go to the House of Representatives, but that's not what happened. So that's why the centennial election, among many reasons, is um, you know is questioned. <clears throat> Led by a former New York City politician, and also a former Civil War general named Dan Sickles, and the New York Times editor John Reed, the Republican Party decided to challenge the reported results. In determining the outcome, the Republicans control the Senate, the Democrats control the House. Under Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution, counting of the ballots of the Electoral College occurs in Congress. If no candidate has a majority, then the outcome is determined by a vote of the states. The Democrats controlled more state delegations in Congress than the Republicans. However, there was controversy over the voting of those four states I mentioned earlier, three from the South, Florida, Louisiana, South Carolina, plus one in Oregon. But that was only one electoral vote in Oregon because one of the guys had to be replaced. The three Southern states had Republican governors, but only because it was Reconstruction. Or at least that was the, you know, the Democrats' position, that it was only because the federal troops were there. Republicans claimed that Democrats in the three southern states prevented Republicans from voting, especially prevented former slaves from voting, thus preventing higher Republican vote counts. So the whole, you know, access to the ballot box and all that, that's, there's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. Nothing. Whereas Democrats accused Republicans of discounting Tilden votes in their reporting of the results. In Florida, Tilden had apparently won by an 80 point, uh, an 80, uh, 80 vote margin. 80 votes, literally 80 votes. Not 80%, 80 votes. The state uh, canvassing board, uh, the, which now that, uh, well, the state canvassing board was controlled by Republicans because of the Reconstruction. They instead certified that Hayes had won by a 45 vote margin. So you see, okay, so the Democrats in Florida say their guy, Tilden, won by 80 votes, whereas the Republicans say their guy won Florida by 45 votes. Democratic electors, backed by a new, a newly elected Democratic governor, informed Congress that Tilden won. But the Republicans said Hayes won. So the battle went to the Florida Supreme Court first, which ruled that the state canvassing board had acted improperly in disregarding returns that it considered fraudulent. As a, there was no clear standard that it used that it could explain to the court for determining that a ballot was fraudulent. In Louisiana, a similar state board reversed an apparent Tilden victory, and Democrats sent their own results favoring Tilden to Congress. Democrats claimed that the head of the Republican board had been bribed to, to just throw out Tilden votes, just throw them in the river. In South Carolina, which elected a former Confederate general as governor, Wade Hampton, in another disputed election, by the way, the state board certified a victory for Hayes, for the Republican. This, that state Supreme Court found them in contempt, fined them, and imprisoned them. Until, and then they, they, they weren't released until uh, 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 writs of habeas corpus were uh, uh, issued by a federal judge. So to overcome Tilden's ostensible lead, Hayes had to win all of the 20 disputed electoral votes in the four contested states, the three Southern plus Oregon. Um, in Oregon, the Democratic governor uh, in dispute, in a dispute about the legitimacy of the electors, declared that Hayes would only receive two of its three electoral votes, which would have elected Tilden by a single vote. Both parties sent representatives to the states whose votes were in question to support their side, to agitate, you know. 
For example, Ohio politicians James Garfield and John Sherman went to New Orleans, Louisiana, to support the Republican-controlled uh, active uh, agitating group. It was called the Returning Board. Both the House and the Senate appointed special committees to investigate the vote counts in the contested states. The majority of both committees declared the victory of their favorite candidate, with minorities finding the opposite results. The House and the Senate then appointed seven member committees to recommend how to determine the disputed election results. Now, this was improper. It should have just gone to the House, to the House of Representatives. That's what the Constitution stipulates. But that's not what happened because they were divided. You see, the Republicans had the Senate, and the Democrats, so that, you know, that's a, uh, both candidates opposed the creation of this special commission. Rightly so, because it's not constitutional. But but what they what they this but the Republicans instead wanted the counting to be done by the Senate president because the Senate was controlled by Republicans. That also is not constitutional. The Constitution said it's, it's the House, and you know whoever controls well, okay, that's it. You know that they control the House, then they win. After rejecting other proposals, Congress decided to create an electoral commission comprised of five senators and five representatives plus five justices of the U.S. Supreme Court. One of the five senators was a Democrat, Alan Thurman of Ohio. Two of the five representatives were from Ohio, Republican James Garfield and Democrat Henry Payne. Garfield, a future president, kept a diary about these proceedings, which are historically very, very significant. Involving the members of the U.S. Supreme Court, in such an inflamed political atmosphere uh, was, well, it was probably a mistake. Well, the whole thing was a mistake because it should have just all gone to the House and then just accept whatever they, you know, whatever they chose. Uh, but they would have voted for their guy, for the, for the Democrat, Tilden. Uh, but there was a precedent for their uh, serving, for members of the Supreme Court serving in, uh, in this, which you know, would have been an executive function. The first Chief Justice, John Jay, had served as President Washington's special envoy in settling disputes with Great Britain related to the Revolutionary War. But that was an ad hoc appointment. It was not an official cabinet appointment. So anyway, uh, with the 10 politicians evenly divided by party affiliation, five Republican, five Democrat. Uh, the, the spotlight was on the appointment of the judges. A consensus emerged that four justices would be appointed with two each believed to be sympathetic to the candidate of opposite parties, so they wanted the judges to be divided too. The four would then choose, those four would then choose the fifth justice. After the chief justice of the court, it was Morrison Waite, W-A-I-T-E, appointed by Grant. Uh, he declined to be considered. He's a wise man, didn't want to be involved in this. Then the unanimous uh, first choice was David Davis, an Illinois lawyer who became a state, leg state legislator, then a judge. Davis managed Lincoln's 1860 presidential campaign. As, and rewarded, as a reward, 1862, Lincoln put Davis on the Supreme Court through a recess appointment. Davis became known for his controversial decision in the ex parte Milligan case, 1866, declaring military trials of civilians during the Civil War to be unconstitutional, which means that he was going, in, going against his patron, Lincoln. Uh, Davis was believed to be, uh, for this reason, Davis was believed to be independent-minded. So as this ad hoc Congressional Election Commission uh, was being put together. The Democratic state, Il the Illinois state legislature, <laughs> elected the same Davis to fill the U.S. Senate seat previously held by um, uh, Black Jack Logan, as he was called, Jack Logan, uh, who was a... Uh, 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 another general, another veteran. However, instead of remaining on the court and serving on the commission, 
Davis said he would resign his seat on the court. He would serve in the Senate until 1883, as it turned out, and would be succeeded by John Marshall Harlan. With the remaining justices, all Republicans, Joseph Bradley was chosen as the fifth justice. Bradley had been appointed by Grant in 1870 and would serve on the court until his death in 1892. So now the, the, the imbalance you know, is now in, in favor of the Republicans. With all this finally decided, the commission held its first meeting on January 31st, 1877. With, at the time, uh, the swearing in, the inauguration of the president was still on March 4th, uh, two months away. Congress met the next day to count the Electoral College votes and with the conflicts over the disputed votes. The outcome was referred to the commission. You know, so the Congress counted all the votes except those four states, and the commission decided on those four states. But because it was so close, whatever that commission decided would decide the election. The decision could only be overruled by an agreement of both houses of Congress, which of course would not happen because the Republicans controlled the Senate and the Democrats controlled the House. After conducting hearings, the commission, now with a majority of Republicans, voted on Florida first. They confirmed the victory of, of the Republican, Hayes, by an 8-7 to seven vote. The commission then voted 8-7, to seven, so you see the majority of Republicans, that decided to accept Hayes' victory in the other three contested states. Uh, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Oregon. The House of Representatives, which was controlled by Democrats, tried to reject all these decisions. And, uh, but you know that's that, that's the problem with this is that this whole procedure was unconstitutional. It should have just been decided in the House. If that means that the Democrat won, well, okay, the Democrat won. But you know. <clears throat> um, and so the Democrats said, okay, Bradley, the you know the last minute Republican addition that you know he was biased and you know that that that, that so then this nullified the whole thing and they wanted to recount. It, it, it was a mess. It was really a mess. Uh, however, by the end of February, some of Hayes's supporters, including Garfield and Sherman, met with Southern Democrat supporters of Tilden, and post facto. Uh, this was referred to as the 1877 Compromise. But it, that has to be in quotes because it was an unspoken agreement uh, or a handshake or, or whatever, but nothing was in writing. That, that, that's why this is so hard to, you know, to reconstruct. Uh, but the, the, supposedly the agreement was that the remaining federal troops would be withdrawn from the South, uh, which the Democrats wanted. Uh, the, the Republicans agreed, you know, that, that Hayes, if, if the Democrats agreed to allow the Republican victory, Hayes, to win, then Hayes would withdraw the federal troops from the South, which is something the Democrats wanted. In addition, uh, Hayes agreed that he would only serve for one term. Democratic opposition, of course, all the Democrats didn't know about this. It was just those involved in this, this, this you know, the, the, the smoky room, the back room deal. Uh, the other Democrats who didn't know about this, uh, they opposed the commission's decision giving the presidency to Hayes um, by a margin of 185 to 184. But that opposition was dropped, uh, and Hayes was finally, de they, the Democrats gave up. Now, why they did that, you know, whether word of mouth spread about the compromise, but regardless, they they ceased opposing the commission on March 2nd in time for the inauguration uh, to take place. Uh, Hayes privately took his oath on March 4th, the constitutional day, but the inauguration ceremony took place the next day, which was a Monday, uh, March 5th. So this ended uh, the closest controversial presidential election uh, since 1824. Uh, the next one, you know, like that would come in 1960 uh, with uh, Kennedy's victory over Nixon and uh, the younger Bush, George W. Bush, his victory over Al Gore and the millennial election of 2000 
which coincidentally, that one also, those of a certain age will remember, uh, the, that, that involved vote counts in Florida, one of the same uh, states. Regardless of the National Democrats just giving in and accepting Hayes uh, for the rest of his, his time, the Democrats called him the Rutherford instead of Rutherford Hayes or his, his fraudulency. Uh, but Hayes did, whatever the compromise was, uh, Hayes did, uh, he did remove federal troops from the South and, as he, and he only served one term. Uh, Tilden, the the loser, although some would say the winner, but the one who just accepted that he was, you know, would not be president, was in poor health, and that prevented his considering running uh, again for president. Uh, and he ended up dying in eighteen eighty six, uh, and he left part of his fortune to help fund the creation of the New York City Public Library. Uh, Blaine, James Blaine, who proposed that amendment and had been a Republican uh, contender for the nomination. Uh, he tried again in 1884, but lost to Grover Cleveland. Uh, Grover Cleveland was the first Democratic president uh, to serve after the Civil War. Winfield Scott Hancock, another one who ran, uh, was a Democratic nominee uh, in 1880, but he lost to James Garfield, the Republican. Garfield had come to the convention as the manager for a fellow Ohio candidate, John Sherman. But he was picked after after 36, well, after 35 ballots. He was picked on the 36th ballot. Um, and Conkling, Roscoe Conkling in New York, uh, also battled, uh, he battled Garfield over civil service reforms. Uh, which we'll talk about later in the century, unless I forget. Uh, but Conklin it did eventually, uh, Chester Arthur, President Chester Arthur, appointed Conklin to the U.S. Supreme Court. <clears throat> All right. Also in the uh, centennial year, 1876, the Centennial International Exhibition was the first World's Fair held in the United States. In Philadelphia, appropriately, the you know the uh, the independence, you know where the Declaration was written, uh, Philadelphia. Uh, it it was held from May tenth to November tenth, eighteen seventy six. Officially called the International Exhibition of Arts, Manufacturers, and Products of the Soil and Mine. It was held in Fairmont Park. In, uh, Philadelphia along the Schuylkill River on grounds designed by Herman Schwartzman. Nearly 10 million visitors attended. And considering the difficulties of travel, that's, I mean, no airplanes, and a, that's, that's a lot. Uh, 37 countries participated at some, you know, pavilion or of various sizes there. The idea of the Centennial ex Exposition uh, was uh, is attributed to John L. Campbell, a professor of mathematics at Wabash College in Indiana. In December of 1866, Campbell suggested to the mayor of Philadelphia, Morton McMichael, that the United States Centennial, coming up 10 years later, be celebrated with a, a major ex ex exposition in in the independent city in Philadelphia. Uh, to this end, the United States Centennial Commission was organized on March 3rd, 1872, with Joseph Hawley of Connecticut as president. The commission has included a representative from each state and territory in, in the United States. On June 1st, 1872, Congress created the Centennial Board of Finance, to help raise money. The mechanism being that the board, Congress authorized the board to sell uh, $10 million worth of stocks uh, via uh, shares uh, in, in this, uh, which they did by February 22, 1873. 
in 18, uh, in that year, 1873, the Centennial Commission named Alfred T. Gorshin uh, got, got, uh, as uh, Director General of the exhibition. And the Fairmont Park Commission set aside 450 acres of West Fairmont Park for the exhibition, which was dedicated on July 4th, 1873. So three years, they gave him three years to, uh, to set everything up. The Centennial National Bank was chartered on January 19th, 1876, to be the financial agent for the board of the Centennial Exhibition, selling $10 million worth of, of bonds. Uh, and, and it also had to, had to deal with uh, foreign currency because they were, they were inviting every nation that wanted to to, to send, and, and so they also had to deal with exchanging foreign currency uh, and provide financial services to, uh, to them. Uh, it opened, the exhibition opened on May 10th. Uh, President Grant and his wife, as well as the Emperor of Brazil, Pedro II and his wife, were there. The official number present on the first day was 186,272. But by the time the exhibition ended on November 10th, the total was 10 million 164,489. Uh, what they saw uh, was a, uh, an astounding uh, achievement, considering they, they put it up in three years. 200 buildings were constructed on the exhibition grounds, surrounded by a fence that was three miles, uh, three-mile perimeter. Uh, had the first Ferris wheel there. The, had typewriter there. I mean, it was it was it was a big it was a big deal, in terms of technology. Uh, there are a lot of stories about it, but I, I just wanted to. It's not particularly church history, so we'll move on. Another incident that occurred in the centennial year. It's not particularly church history, but it's famous, so I'll mention it. June twenty fifth, eighteen seventy six. George Armstrong Custer. General in the United States Army, along with 200 cavalrymen, were annihilated at the Battle of the Little Bighorn River uh, by the uh, Sioux, by the Sioux Indians, led by their chiefs, uh, by chiefs Sitting Bull, Chief Gall, and Chief Crazy Horse. On Sunday, it was a Sunday, June 25th, 1876, Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer led 210 men of the U.S. 7th Cavalry to their death at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. It was the Army's worst defeat of the Plains Indian Wars. The prelude to Custer's last stand began uh, years earlier, actually began eight years earlier. So remember, nothing just happens. Nothing just happens. So 1876, the Treaty of Fort Laramie, created the Sioux Reservation, or the Great Sioux Reservation, as they called it, uh, which included the Black Hills as a homeland for the, bay, for the bands of the Lakota and Cheyenne. The government's objective was to settle the Indians down on the reservation where they could be more easily controlled, surveilled and controlled, frankly. I mean, that, you know, that... Um, however, however... Six years later, 1874, rumors of gold being found in the Black Hills was confirmed by a geological team accompanying Custer's troops. And miners, of course, you know, gold, then, then miners start to invade. We start to go in and want to mine on land that had been set aside as a reservation by the Treaty of Fort Laramie. Um. This abrogation, or at least de facto abrogation of the treaty rights, uh, encouraged the Lakota and the Cheyenne to resist restriction to the reservation. And so they said, well, okay, if you're coming on our land to, to mine gold, then we can go outside the reservation to hunt. So that's what they did. They, they started continue, they were hunting bison in Nebraska, as far away as Nebraska, Wyoming, and Montana. And uh, so conflicts ensued. You know, as people in those states said, well, the Indians are supposed to be on their reservation. 
Well, then the Indians would say, well, you know, you're not supposed to be on our reservation, yet we have some, uh, you know, some of uh, your people here digging, digging for gold in our hills. In December of 1875, the U.S. government gave the tribes, the Sioux, the Lakota, the Cheyenne, a 30-day deadline to return to their reservations, or they would be considered outlaws and subject to military reprisals. Uh, they refused. Many of them refused. In the spring of 1876, the, the, the U.S. government, the federal government, launched a three-prong campaign against the Cheyenne and the Lakota. The first prong was commanded by Colonel John Gibbon. He marched east from Fort Ellis, which is present day in, well, is uh, on the site, uh, present day Bozeman, Montana. The second prong was led by General Alfred Terry, T E R R Y. That prong included Custer, headed west from Fort Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> as it was called, but it's near present day Bismarck, North Dakota. The third prong, uh, led by General George Crook, yes, Crook, C-R-O-O-K, uh, moved north from Wyoming into Montana. These three units planned to converge near the end of June in the vicinity of the Little Bighorn River. Unknown to the first contingent's commander, Gibbon, or the second contingent's commander, Terry, unknown to them, the third contingent's commander, Crook, General Crook, encountered the Indians' resistance near Rosebud Creek in southern Montana. The Indians engaged and defeated him about a week before the famous battle with Custer. After this, Crook's force, uh, um, Crook, Crook withdrew to Wyoming, uh, breaking one side of the triangle. So the three prongs were, you know, so that the whole the whole point was a, a pincer, a three prong pincer. Well, one one wasn't going to be there. The other two didn't know this, so the second contingent's commander Terry was moving west up the Yellowstone River, approaching Little Bighorn. The uh, and his uh, his contingent included the Seventh Cavalry under Custer. And part of the cavalry's job is to is reconnaissance, is to scout. So Custer scouted ahead on June twenty second. On the morning of the twenty fifth, they reached uh, uh, the fork, uh, a, 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 um, a, a space of land between the Rosebud and the Little Bighorn rivers. From a spot known, uh, well, subsequently called the Crow's Nest, they observed a large Indian camp, armed. Uh, and worried, Custer was afraid that if, if he took the time to go back and report this and then get more troops to attack, that by that point the Indians would move because that was, that was their thing, was mobility. Uh, and then once they, if they made it up into, the, into a more mountainous region, then there'd be no catching them because the cavalry, the horses can't, you know, can't climb mountains as well as humans can. So that's the background for Custer's decision to attack to go from the crow's nest down the valley of the Little Bighorn River. Custer assumed his approximately 600-member command would be facing at most 800 braves, Indian, Indian warriors. Instead, so the cavalry's job is reconnaissance, but he, he made this decision without a complete reconnaissance because, as it turned out, the Indian camp consisted of 8,000. <laughs> And at least 2,000 of them were armed warriors, ready to fight. Custer divided the 7th Cavalry into three elements during the early phases of the battle and then subdivided his immediate command into two wings. The Lakota and the Cheyenne, although surprised by the Army's attack, uh, quickly rallied and uh, put all, I mean, they weren't all that, I mean, they, they were surprised that he showed up there at that minute, but they were not surprised that they were going to have to fight, you know, because they, they were off the reservation and they consciously decided, you know, they, they said that, that we've lost so much, it's, it's not, you know, we've we got to fight some, sometimes. So the, they were not surprised that they were going to have to fight. So they were armed, they were ready, but they were surprised on that day at that moment. But because they knew they were going to be fighting eventually, they quickly rallied and, 
and achieve the upper hand. So the Seventh Cavalry was on the defensive. Uh, the Indians fought in small, uh, small groups, very mobile. Uh, they used their superior numbers, uh, as well as their, uh, you know, the, the one, the, at least those who were on foot, they were able to take advantage of cover better than, you know, mounted cavalry soldiers, and proceeded to uh, uh, a sniper, you know, uh, uh, snipe at the at the soldiers from a distance. Meanwhile, the cavalry uh, trained. Uh, in formation, they assumed one of their one of their formations, which was an open skirmish uh, skirmish order. The result being that they were widely dispersed and became easy targets. It was easy to you know to separate them, cordon them off, and kill them. Encircled by mounted forces led by chiefs Crazy Horse Gaul and Gaul, Custer's entire command perished. The news of Custer's defeat. Uh, reach was reported in the American newspapers during the celebration of the nation's centennial. This is still the centennial year. The reaction was outrage, demands for military reprisals, uh, which which were were pretty severe, and uh, and ended up confining the Lakota and the Cheyenne who survived the reprisals uh, to their res- to the reservation uh, eventually. Following the Battle of the Little Bighorn, the Black Hills, uh, the, the, the Treaty of, of Fort Laramie was abrogated, and the Black Hills were confiscated by the United States uh, because of the gold. You know, that, that, that was just, it was a, a strategic resource, you know, that could not, be, uh, could not be ignored. The site of the battle is, is now a monument, it's a national monument. Uh, so you can, you know, see. I'll look it up. For uh, in terms of religious history, by the time we reach the centennial year, uh, this was uh, this was a golden age for American Protestantism, uh, like the 1950s would be for for American Catholics. Uh, meaning that for uh, in this post Civil War period, the Protestant churches were were filled to overflowing. They had a uh, broad influence in uh, the public arena. Uh, many uh, politicians. Uh, were friendly to them, or in some cases were actually former ministers themselves. Uh, and they saw, you know, after the Civil War that they, you know, slavery was was gone, and the Industrial Revolution was was churning up, and uh, Manifest Destiny had, you know, had brought the the borders of the country from Atlantic to Pacific. Uh, so they they saw this as a a vindication, you know, of the the city on the hill. Which led to, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, many pre-Civil War patterns were uh, social, economic, political, were put on hold during the war, and then after the war were reformulated, but in a different way. So the, the pre-Civil War, New England humanitarian, Unitarian movements, uh, like for the like abolition of slavery, the public school movement, labor rights, women's rights. Post Civil War, those would be reformulated into the social gospel movement, and then as as the decades progressed, the social gospel movement became secularized into the progressive movement. Meaning that uh, there were those who, after the war, reached the same conclusion that McGlynn and McSweeney and other guys we covered earlier uh, had reached, that the, a strong federal government had proven efficacious in eliminating slavery and saving the Union at great cost, but it still, it worked. And so if it could work there, maybe retaining a strong federal government could have additional benefits. Uh Okay. In terms of the Catholics in this period, over one million Catholics uh, poured into the country uh, each decade between 1880 and 1920, and over two million in uh, 1901. So the Catholic population 
grew from 6.2 million in 1880 to 16.3 million in 1910, which is the last census before the First World War, out of a national population that went from 75.9 million in 1880 to 91.9 million in 1910. Okay, yeah, I'll skip all that. Yeah, yeah, I'll skip all that. Religious magazines multiply. As uh, now we get, you know, get, you know, some second and third generation uh, Catholic children of, of, of immigrants, but they, they've been educated, uh, had found their place in society, had found some success, and, uh, you know, were literate and. And so there was a there was a market, you know, for 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 more Catholic writing. Uh, so religious magazines uh, or religious publications multiplied. Ave Maria, uh, eighteen sixty five, was published by Notre at at Notre Dame University by the Congregation of the Holy Cross. The Catholic World was published by the Paulist. The Messenger of the Sacred Heart, published by the Jesuits, etc. Isaac Hecker, he keeps coming into our story again, founder of Americanism. In 1870, he established a monthly journal. In addition to the Paulist Catholic world, he established a monthly journal uh, called The Young Catholic, an illustrated magazine for young folks. <laughs> That's what it was called. Uh, his sister-in-law, Josephine Wentworth Hecker, married to one of his brothers, served as editor. The Paulist uh, also created the Catholic Publication Society, which is now Paulist Press, and a number of uh, commercial publishing houses, other publishing houses, made a living exclusively from publishing Catholic material, which is evidence that the, you know, the the second and third generation of you know children of Catholic immigrants had had done it. I mean, they become educated, they integrated into the, into the society and the economy, and had disposable income and leisure time to buy this kind of stuff and read it. <clears throat> Prayer books, uh, manuals of instruction, uh, paid for themselves. You know, I mean, that's how good it was It was going. I mean, not every single one. I mean, obviously there's some, you know, failures, but um, but on the whole, it was a, it was a, it was a good time. Prosperous time. <clears throat> the first Catholic novel written in the United States, uh, was titled uh, Father Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, written by Charles Constantine Pies, P-I-S-E. It, was, um, um, it's a no it is a novel, but it, it's, it's a didactic fiction, uh, which is not bad, but it, you know, it, it's... it's, uh, it's it's not an epic, you know, historical novel, but it's it's didactic. So uh, it was the first, and others would follow. Okay. Also, the centennial year, Colorado admitted as the thirty eighth state on August first, eighteen seventy six. Colorado, uh, a beautiful territory. It's a state in the in the west, uh, western United States, and. Oh, Uh, it encompasses uh, most of the southern Rocky Mountains, as well as the northeastern portion of a plateau, the Colorado Plateau, which uh, and the western edge of the Great Plains. Uh, Colorado is the eighth state in terms of uh, ter size, territorial size. It's 104,000 square miles, uh, which is, in terms of, it's not shaped the same way, but in terms of square miles, is the same as New Zealand also 104,000 square miles. Colorado is the, the word Colorado is uh, derived from the Spanish adjective meaning uh, reddish or, or ruddy, describing the, the ubiquity of the red sandstone in the region. 
went through the same the process, the territorial process. Uh, the territory was created on February 28, 1861. And on August 1st, 1876, uh, President Grant signed the uh, Proclamation 230, admitting Colorado to the Union as state number 38. It is nicknamed the Centennial State because admitted one century after the signing of the Declaration. Uh, the capital is Denver. The um, election of Abraham Lincoln for, as president in 1860 as we, you know, led to the secession and the, and the Civil War. Uh, so what they, so that the Union, the, the North, sought to expand. Uh, and so the Republican-dominated Congress during the war uh, quickly admitted the eastern portion of the territory of Kansas into the Union as the state of Kansas, the free state of Kansas, in 1861 leaving the western portion of the Kansas Territory still at the territorial status because it didn't have the population uh, needed for a, for a state. On February 28, 1861, the outgoing U.S. President James Buchanan signed the Act of Congress organizing the Free Territory of Colorado. The original boundaries of Colorado remain unchanged except for a, a few survey amendments. In terms of religious history, in 1776, a Spanish priest named Silvestre Velez de Escalante uh, recorded that Native Americans in the area knew of a, a river that they called, uh, that, well, that he called El Rio Colorado because of the red-brown silt that the river carried from the mountains, which means he was there. I mean, so in 1776, there was a, a Spanish Catholic priest there. In 1859, the U.S. Army topographical survey uh, was led by Captain John McComb, located the confluence of the Green River with the Grand River in what is now a national park, Canyonlands National Park in Utah. The Macomb Party designated the confluence as the source of the Colorado River. Although, you know, those of you interested are, you know that that uh, water rights in that part of the country are a matter of, of dispute and have all been confused because of the ubiquity of, of dams uh, constructed. But that's for later in history. And uh, the Civil War began April 12, 1861, as we covered. 1862, a force from Texas, which was a Confederate state, a uh, cavalry force, invaded the territory of New Mexico and captured Santa Fe on March 10th. The object was to seize the gold fields uh, of Colorado and California and possibly seize ports on the Pacific Ocean for the Confederacy. Uh, Colorado, the people living in Colo the territory of Colorado, organized a volunteer force to, to, uh, to, to resist this. And, and they marched from, from Denver uh, to New Mexico in an attempt to, you know, to oppose the Texans. On March 28th, the Colorado force, along with local New Mexico volunteers, engaged the Texans at the Battle of the Glorietta Pass and achieved victory, destroying their cannon and supply wagons and dispersing 500 of their horses and their uh, the mules, the supply mules. So the Texans were forced to retreat back to Santa Fe, having lost the supplies for their campaign and finding very little support in New Mexico uh, the Texans abandoned Santa Fe and then returned back to Texas in defeat. That was the uh, the last Confederate attempt to take any territory in the southwestern United States. In 1864, the territorial governor of Colorado, John Evans, appointed a Methodist minister Reverend John Shivington, as a colonel of the Colorado Volunteers, 
or the militia, so to speak, uh, with their mission being to protect settlers from the Cheyenne and the Arapaho, whom the settlers accused of stealing their cattle. The minister, the Reverend, the Reverend Colonel Shivington, ordered his men to attack uh, a band of Cheyenne and Arapaho on the Sand River, a Sand Creek. Shivington reported that his troops killed more than 500 of the, of the Indian warriors. They then returned to Denver in triumph. However, several of those present uh, reported or leaked uh, that the battle was not really a battle, that it was a massacre, and that the 500 killed were not armed warriors, but that they were you know, young, you know, young kids and, and women and that the bodies, they stated, that the bodies had been mutilated after. The U.S. Army held three inquiries into the action, even though this was a militia, it wasn't part of the regular army. The incoming president, Andrew Johnson, who you know succeeded when he was vice president, Lincoln's vice president, and then when Lincoln was murdered, became president, asked for the resignation of governor, the territorial governor, John Evans. Uh, but that was it. Uh, no one else, the, the, the inquiry ceased there. And the event is now known as the Sand Creek Massacre. In the, uh, let's see, September 14th, 1864, a guy named James Huff discovered silver uh, first of many silver strikes in Colorado. 1867, the Union Pacific Railroad laid tracks west to Weir, uh, which is now Julesburg in the uh, northeast corner of the territory. The Union Pacific linked with the Central Pacific Railroad at Promontory Summit, Utah, on May 10, 1869 marking the completion of the first transcontinental railroad going from coast to coast. And from there, other railroads you know, emanated to, to intersect. And that uh, The Denver Pacific Railway reached Denver in June of the following year, and the Kansas Pacific two months later to create a second line across the continent. In 1872, more rich veins of silver were discovered in the San Juan Mountains, alas, for the indigenous people, it was uh, on the the uh, the Ute U T E the Ute Indian Reservation in southwestern Colorado. So the Ute were removed from the San Juan Hills in the following year, again for strategic reasons. That you know, silver like gold is a, a precious metal, a strategic resource, and the government decided that that could you know that could not be ignored. The Congress passed the Enabling Act on March 3, 1875, specifying the requirements for the territory of Colorado to become a state. August 1, 1876, four weeks after the centennial of the United States, President Grant signed a proclamation admitting Colorado to the Union as state number 33. 1878, another silver mine, a silver load was discovered near Leadville. And uh, this triggered, a, well, not really, it was at our, the Colorado silver boom, like the silver rush, like the California gold rush, this was the Colorado silver rush. In 1890, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act uh, invigorated silver mining, uh, by, was by public-private partnership. And uh, Colorado's last, but, uh, well, not last, but uh, it's a gold strike. The next was a gold strike. And uh, it was the largest in, Cal in uh, Colorado history. Uh, was made a few months later. And it lured a whole new generation uh, of settlers. Colorado granted women the right to vote on November 7th, 1893. Making Colorado the second state to grant uh, uh, to, to grant that suffrage to, to men and women, uh, adult men and women. Uh, okay. 
Uh, president 19, Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, we covered his election. Uh, he was president from March 4th, 1877 to March 4th, 1881. Born in Delaware, Ohio, he left uh, to study law at Harvard, returned, settled in Cincinnati, entered local politics. During the war, he volunteered. Uh, he enlisted in the 23rd Ohio Regiment, serving until 1864 earned numerous commendations for valor, and retired as a major general, a two-star general. He returned to politics as a Republican, representative for Ohio, then governor of Ohio, as we already covered. And his presidential election, uh, we covered. After he, uh, he had promised that he would not run for a second term, he kept that promise. So after he left office, he served on the Board of Trustees for Ohio State University, and he uh, quite enjoyed that. Uh, when his wife Lucy died, he retired from all public activities until he died of uh, heart failure in 1893. He ended Reconstruction. Reconstruction was followed by the Jim Crow movement, which can be dated 1877 to 1965, so uh, almost a full century. Well, 98 years. No, that is about almost a, a century. Uh, with the removal of the federal occupation troops from the former Confederate states, Southern Democrats regained control of the state governments. They began in 1877 passing a series of laws that, you know, later in the 20th century would be called apartheid, nullifying the 14th and 15th Amendments, which had granted adult African Americans civil rights, including the right to vote, uh, at least African-American males. These laws enforced social separation and restricted voting to educated white property owners who could pass a literacy test and pay a poll tax. The laws are generally referred to as Jim Crow, uh, and I've seen two explanations for, for the origin of that term. One uh, origin is, is that it was a, a hateful song uh, ridiculing blacks, or that Jim Crow was a blackface slave character uh, played on a, on a stage uh, by an actor. It was like a recurring, uh, it was like his signature character, a guy named Thomas Rice. Jim Crow apartheid was challenged before the Supreme Court in the famous case of Plessy versus Ferguson, which we'll cover later uh, in. 1896. Uh, Homer Plessy, who was uh, from here, from New Orleans, uh, was in the same parish that earlier Henriette de Lille was in, St. Augustine. He was uh, what was called, now again, I'm, I don't want to offend anyone, but this is what it was called at the time, an, an octoroon, meaning that he was, he was one-eighth black. He was arrested in, here in Louisiana for refusing to leave a white-only uh, a car on a railway train. He sued, claiming that his rights under the 14th Amendment had been violated. So that worked its way up to the Supreme Court. In 1896, the court ruled 8 to 1 that separate but equal accommodations did not violate the Constitution, arguing that the 14th Amendment protections applied to political equality. So separation laws and other spheres of life were not prohibited. The church in the South generally conformed to these laws. As a result, separate parishes and schools for blacks were created by Southern bishops, and where separate churches were not possible, separate seating or standing arrangements were enforced. State-sponsored School segregation was struck down by the Supreme Court when it reversed itself in the, uh, in the Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. And the rest of the Jim Crow laws were struck down a decade later by the Civil Rights Act in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act in 1965. In terms of uh, going back to the hierarchy, uh, something else happened in the centennial year, 1876. The succession to Baltimore. I alluded to this earlier, but here's the details. In April of 1876, Archbishop Bailey, B-A-Y, 
L E Y of Baltimore, requested a coadjutor bishop, a meaning a designated successor, and nominated as his first choice James Gibbons, who at the time was serving as Bishop of Richmond, Virginia, and as Apostolic Vicar of North Carolina. Uh, Bishop Becker of Wilmington attempted to sabotage this appointment, uh, uh, accusing Gibbons of unorthodoxy with regard to papal infallibility. And later, Gibbons would be implicated uh, as one of the Americanists when Americanism was condemned in 1899. But anyway, uh, the propagation of the faith investigated the accusation. They could not find that he had ever written anything against papal infallibility, as had Archbishop Kenrick of St. Louis. Uh, nor had he spoken against infallibility uh, in any record that they could find. It is a measure of the contempt for American intellectual prowess held at the Vatican that that was the best they expected from from Americans. So Gibbons uh, was, was nominated by the Propagation of the Faith on May 7th, and uh, he was appointed coadjutor for Baltimore by Pope Pius IX on May 25th, 1876. Archbishop Bailey died later that year, October 3rd, so James Gibbons automatically succeeded becoming Archbishop of Baltimore. To obtain his pallium, uh, it's a special vestment that, that archbishops wear. It's a, it's a stylized ox's yoke. It's a circular uh, piece of wool. It comes together, and, it, it, it's, and then it has uh, nail, uh, pins in it, like the nails, nails of Christ. Uh, Gibbons dispatched a newly ordained Richmond priest, you know, from where he was, where Gibbons was bishop, named Dennis O'Connell. Dennis O'Connell became his protege, a uh, priest and a prominent figure in the 19th century American Catholic Church. He, he served as rector of the North American College in Rome, later as bishop of Richmond, Virginia. And he's going to be one of the figures in the Americanist controversy. But he's one of Gibbons. He's like Gibbons man. Gibbons planned his investiture for February 10th, 1876, but learned that Pope Pius IX died three days earlier. Initially disposed to delay the ceremony, he was persuaded by Cardinal McCleskey of New York to proceed, particularly as the apostolic delegate to Canada, Bishop Conroy, would then be able to attend. Other leaders in the Americanist, what is going to become the, the late 19th century Americanist controversy, um, Gibbon's promotion to Baltimore left the Diocese of Richmond, Virginia vacant. So Gibbons maneuvered another protege into that position, John Kane, it's spelled Keane, K-E-A-N-E. At the time, he was stationed at St. Patrick's in Washington, D.C. Uh, Keene uh, later became rector of the Catholic University of America and would become another prominent figure in the Americanism crisis. And Keene's spiritual director was Father Isaac Hecker. All right. The Bishop Conroy that uh, Gibbons, that was mentioned, that McCluskey mentioned to Gibbons. That's a story in itself. Uh, started the following the year after the centennial, so 1877 into 78. In the year that Reconstruction ended, 1877, though not in any way connected to the event, the Vatican made another attempt to accomplish what it had sought to accomplish by the Bedini mission of 1853, which we covered earlier was a disaster. The Vatican dispatched an Irish bishop named George Conroy to Canada on a diplomatic mission, which was publicly announced to take place in 1877. He had a secret mission also. His secret orders were to request that he be given a tour of the United States by the American bishops, but a tour as a private person. You know, uh, that it, this was not because there were no diplomatic relations with the United States. And the bishops could hardly refuse. 
However, since he was representing the Vatican in Canada, there was no need to inform the United States government, which kept it out of the papers. Bishop Conroy was instructed to interview as many bishops as possible and assemble as many facts as possible without letting anyone know that he was a spy, that he was compiling a report. Conroy traveled around 1877 and 78, following the railways in a circle around the entire United States. This was the first time in history that a Vatican official had visited so much of the country. Conroy's report to the Vatican was detailed and scathing. To summarize, first, the United States, in his opinion, was canonically irregular because it was classified as mission territory under the propagation of the faith, yet at the same time it had wealthy cities filled with millions of Catholics. Second, mission status gave bishops unlimited jurisdiction to move priests or dismiss them at will without canonical appeal. We already covered that problem because mission territory has no technically has no pastors, only rectors, representing the bishop who would be canonically the only pastor. The absence of any protection resulted in countless appeals to Rome against what priests described as the autocracy of bishops. Third, because of the seemingly limitless immigration uh, and unlimited territory of the nation, the Catholic Church in the country had grown to accommodate populations far larger than dioceses in Europe, which were centuries old. This rapid population increase required instant services. As a result, bishops in the U.S. had to go into ruinous debt to build parishes, schools, hospitals, etc. In a few years, creating the largest network of private schools and hospitals in the world in the 19th century. Fourth, he concluded, the immense indebtedness which this expansion uh, entailed unduly distracted bishops and priests with financial matters and led to value being placed on men with business skill rather than on men with holiness and learning. So, the Conroy Report. The uh, second year of, uh, of, of, of his visitation, 1878, saw uh, brings us back to Cincinnati to a guy we've uh, met many times, although now we see him at the end of his life. It's very sad. This is the Purcell Bank Scandal of 1878 in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. Bishop Conroy happened to still be in the country when this erupted into disaster. And coincidentally, it was, the four, it was his fourth his summary point. Uh, so, John B. Purcell, born Ireland, 1783, came to the United States, became second bishop of Cincinnati, Ohio in 1833, and he was still there when it was elevated to a metropolitan see, so he became the first archbishop in 1850. In 1838, Bishop Purcell ordained his younger brother Edward a priest, even though his brother had never completed any regular seminary program. The bishop entrusted his brother Edward with the financial affairs of the diocese, which Father Edward fulfilled by opening a diocesan bank and encouraging the many Catholic immigrants to deposit their money with this church bank instead of in banks run by Protestants or Jews. For 40 years, this bank flourished, financing the expansion of the diocese and garnering deposits totaling $25 million. And that's in, you know, 1870s money. Part of the secret of the bank's success was Father Edwards' consistent investment of his depositors' money in railroad expansion, which was a thriving enterprise in Ohio. And that all went well, until it all came crashing down in 1878, when one of the railroad companies 
Father Edward invested in went bankrupt. Those who worked for the railroad then went to the bank to get to get their money, withdraw their money, because they didn't, you know, they needed it. They didn't have any income now. This forced Father Edward, and he did. He he repaid, you know, as the first ones who came. It forced him to empty his reserves. But since the investments were no longer bringing in revenue, he soon ran out of cash to repay the depositors. So when it was all done, the math indicated that he owed, the bank owed $2.5 million more than it had. This was a disaster not only in economic terms, but incalculably more so in terms of the trust of the church as the depositors were loyal Catholic immigrants who only invested in that bank because they trusted the church. Archbishop Purcell never really understood the financial dynamics of the problem, but he he did understand that it was a point of honor for the church that every single investor had to be repaid. For this reason, he closed the seminary, which he had built, sold the diocesan newspaper, sold off much land, which, which he had intended to use for expansion of new parishes, and even that wasn't enough. So he had to beg bishops of wealthier dioceses to save the honor of the church by donating rescue money. The debt was eventually repaid, but it was a national scandal, which the new newspapers of the day reported with glee. In fact, Bishop Conroy on his spying expedition, first learned of it in a San Francisco newspaper. Archbishop Purcell never recovered. He was, he was really broken by this humiliation. Uh, he died a broken man in 1883. In his report, Conroy pointed to this as a perennial danger in the United States because bishops and priests were forced to be obsessed with financial matters. And if they did not have the gifts for it, they were forced to rely on others who might use their position to harm the church. Conroy went on to note that the church in America was beset by rabid anti-Catholicism, something to which he was particularly sensitive to growing up in Ireland under the British occupation. Conroy complained that the American clergy generally coped with this by excessive accommodation to the Protestant ruling class, and de-emphasizing Catholic doctrine and distinctive Catholic devotional practices. So, in other words, he recognized the influence of the Anglo-American Maryland Catholicism, even though he didn't call it that. Conroy ended his report by ridiculing what he called the poor intellectual attainments of American clergy, expressing a typical European contempt for American education and scholarship and lack of multiple language acquisition. Bishop Conroy's report was devastating to the reputation of the American Catholic Church in the eyes of the Curia and the Vatican. As a result of it, the Vatican set their policy for the next century based on Conroy's report, which included seeking to impose canonical regularity on the country which was not achieved until the Third Council of Baltimore in 1884. As an interim attempt to stem the tide of canonical appeals, the propaganda issued an Instructio in 1879, which provided for a diocesan process and a provincial appeal before removing a rector from a mission against his will. Only then could it be appealed to Rome. The Vatican also moved toward establishing permanent diplomatic relations between the Vatican and the United States. Because of the anti-Catholicism in the land, it took until 1893 to reach this, and then it was only a low-level apostolic delegate. Full diplomatic relations didn't, were not accomplished until January 10, 1984, and from then until now, The Vatican sends a full ambassador, an apostolic nuncio. Another Vatican strategy, in light of the Conroy report, 
was to seek to Romanize the hierarchy by selecting men as bishops who had been trained in Rome and coping with the immigrant problem, which is really the language problem, by permitting ethnic parishes but not ethnic dioceses. All right, so that last brings us to a, a clerical race war. Remember, ethnic hatred is, is always an effective tool of the demonic. Uh, so uh, one of them occurred within the church, among the clergy, in 1878 with regard to the succession of uh, Milwaukee. The background of which, on November 28, 1843, the Diocese of Milwaukee was created out of the Diocese of Detroit, and Detroit had been carved out of Cincinnati. Upon the recommendation of the German-born Bishop of Detroit, Frederick Reze, the Swiss-born John Martin Henney was appointed founding Bishop of Milwaukee because of his language skills and nearly 15 years of experience in the United States. The Diocese of Milwaukee flourished under Henney's leadership. On March 3, 1868, the Catholic population justified the creation of two new dioceses carved out of Milwaukee's territory, the Diocese of La Crosse and the Diocese of Green Bay, both in Wisconsin. Upon Henney's recommendation, the founding bishop of La Crosse was Michael Heiss, H-E-I-S-S, who was born in Germany in 1818, emigrated to the U.S., was ordained as a priest for service in the Diocese of Bardstown, Kentucky in 1840, and the following year the see was moved to Louisville. Upon Henny's recommendation, the founding bishop of Green Bay was Joseph Melker, M-E-L-C-H-E-R, born in Austria, 1806, ordained for service in St. Louis, Missouri, 1830, and destined to serve as founding bishop of Green Bay until his death. After Melker's death in 1873, Henny managed to have another German-born priest named as second bishop of Green Bay, Francis Krautbauer. Born 1824, immigrated to the United States, ordained a priest for the Diocese of Buffalo, and served as second bishop of Green Bay for a decade, 1875 to 85. In recognition of his importance and that of Milwaukee, Henny C. was elevated to an archdiocese with himself as the first archbishop two years later on February 12, 1875. Three years later, 1878, Henny wished a coadjutor, and a successor, designated successor. And the one he wanted was another German priest, uh, Michael Heiss, whom we've already met, who was serving then at the, as Bishop of La Crosse uh, uh, in Milwaukee. In response, it was this request that, that triggered it, the, the clerical race war. In response to this request, that he as a Swiss be followed as by a German, uh, a group of Irish priests serving in Wisconsin wrote a letter of protest to Rome. They complained that the Germans in Wisconsin would only attend German-speaking parishes, meaning that they were not supporting their territorial parishes. An even greater problem, they complained, was that the German schools were gaining a reputation for being better than the existing Catholic schools so that American-born Catholics were sending their children to those schools instead of their own parochial schools, even if those children were not German. They argued if Henny was allowed to handpick another German bishop as his replacement, it would only perpetuate the separatism, which they believed was the great vice of the German immigrants. Assimilation, these Irish priests concluded, was the best way for the Germans to leave their past behind. 
Assimilation meant the English language, and it meant participating in their territorial parishes and schools rather than creating their own. So here we see the circle. A few videos ago, I spent a great deal of time on the Kulturkampf, and this is why. It's to understand why these Germans were acting this way. These Germans were part of the waves of Catholics who fled Germany because of the Kulturkampf, because of religious persecution. And, and so they, the, those, those German Catholics who remained in Germany, like Windhorst, were accommodationist. Whereas these, those, these Germans who fled came to the United States were not. So they wanted to emphasize their faith. You know, they, they, they emphasized the devotions, the distinct Catholic, you know, the Eucharistic processions, devotion to Our Lady, devotion to the saints. They, they emphasized all of that. And the Irish didn't like it. The Irish priest didn't like that. Uh, so to foster assimilation, these Irish priests begged Rome to refuse the request of Archbishop Henning and instead appoint a non-German as coadjutor, as designated successor. The complaint was leaked to the newspapers of the day, no doubt by one of the complainers. So the ethnic fight between German and Irish Catholics, German and Irish clergy, became a public scandal and the new, which the newspapers gleefully publicized, and another national humiliation for the American Catholic hierarchy. Because of the publicity, and because of the impeccable records of both Henning and Heiss, Rome could not do otherwise than support Archbishop Henning, and they did appoint Heiss as coadjutor. Heiss, being human, bore a grudge against the Irish for the rest of his life which is going to have significance later in the, in, the, in the century. The larger significance of this fight is that it prefigured similar conflicts to be played out over and over and over within the American Catholic Church, and up to this day, between immigrant groups who became established versus those immigrant groups newly arrived. In this episode, the, uh, Rome did not make a policy decision beyond just appointing the guy that Henny wanted. <clears throat> and no more, because in that same year, 1878, Pope Pius IX died and was followed as Pope 256 by Leo XIII. Uh, but the issue would not go away. Let's see. <clears throat> we come to the uh, end of the near of the decade. Uh, Chicago becomes an archdiocese in 1879. The background, in 1867, we, could, we mentioned this earlier, but to remind you, uh, the Bishop of Chicago, James Duggan, began acting erratically. Uh, they called it senility. It was probably Alzheimer's or you know, something like that. Uh, but by 1869, he was, he was considered irretrievable, so he was put in, a, in an asylum. Um, Archbishop Kenrick of St. Louis put him in an asylum, uh, since Chicago was within his metropolitan province at the time. A priest from Baltimore named Father Thomas Foley was sent to administer Chicago until Duggan recovered. He never did recover, and he died on January 11, 1879. In Chicago, then, with a vacant see, a faction of Irish priests in Chicago, resentful of their subordination to St. Louis, successfully lobbied the propaganda in Rome to elevate Chicago to the status of a metropolitan archdiocese and to appoint an ethnically Irish man as archbishop, uh, Patrick Feehan, at the time serving as bishop of Nashville. And Rome did. The decision is dated August 16, 1880. Initially, Chicago had only two suffragans, the Diocese of Peoria and the Diocese of Alton. Same year. It's not church history, but it did change history, so we have to mention it. On October 21st, 1879, an Ohio-born inventor named Thomas Alva Edison, working in Menlo Park, New Jersey, mounted a scorched cotton thread in the center so a thread in the center 
of a spherical glass case. Remove the air to create a vacuum, preventing oxidation of the thread. Ran an electric current through the thread, and the thread luminesced for 40 continuous hours. Thereby, the light bulb had been invented, and everything changed. On December 31st, Edison made history by lighting the street leading to his lab in Menlo Park using lamps uh, employing this new technology. An English engineer named Joseph Swan had created an, an incandescent light bulb using a carbon filament on December 18th, 1878, 13 months before Edison. But Edison beat him in the race to get the patent and to install it in a working system of public use lamps, which was a striking you know, sales pitch, a proof of concept. Edison, uh, he changed history in many ways. He was born in Milan, Ohio. His total formal education in school was three months, even though his mother was a former school teacher. So she basically homeschooled him. At the age of 12, because he exhibited such maturity and, and you know, precocious ability, he convinced his parents to allow him to leave home and work as a newsboy aboard a train to Detroit. He published a weekly paper and sold it to travelers. Learning to operate a telegraph, he gained employment and, and got to look on, on the inside of some equipment, which you know triggered something in his, in his brain, and, and his life was never the same. After a few years as a wandering telegraph operator, Edison settled in New York. Always uh, during employment in his spare time, he worked on his inventions and his experiments. Edison received $40,000, a lot of money then, uh, on ideas for improving the telegraph and the telephone. Using that money, he went out on his own. He built a workshop first at West Orange, New Jersey. There, he invented the phonograph, which is the, an early version of a record player, and the light bulb followed. Edison patented over a thousand inventions from his laboratory, including the moving pictures machine, a storage battery, a mimeograph machine, which was a, a precursor to the Xerox machine, uh, machines to iron, uh, and machines that would uh, assist in the uh, steel, uh, steel uh, business. His inventions made possible electric trains and electric streetcars as well as, you know, <laughs> the lamp. Uh, during the First World War, when it began, Edison was age 70. Uh, the government asked him to serve, um, the, uh, not in the, you know, not in, the, in combat, but to, to serve in the industrial side. He built a factory in 18 days. There he made many things which helped the Army and the Navy. In his 80s, his health began to fail. He obtained his last patent at age 83. It was his 1,093rd patent. In August of 1931, Edison collapsed at his residence, the Glenmont uh, estate. It was a 15-acre estate. And from that point, he steadily declined. He was homebound uh, until his death uh, at 3.21 a.m. on October 18th. Uh, The evening of the day he was buried, uh, October 18th, 1931. So he was born February 11th, 1847. Died um, October 18th, 1931. The uh, the evening of the day he was buried, uh, thousands, thousands came, you know, uh, for, uh, for for the a tribute, uh, including uh, Mrs. Herbert Hoover, the first lady. Uh, well, former former first lady, Henry Ford, uh, the, uh, Harvey Firestone, uh, the tire guy. He was buried at Rosedale Cemetery in Orange, New Jersey, uh, with Mina, his second wife, buried beside him upon her death. In 1963, his remains, 
uh, both, well, hers too, both remains were exhumed from Rosedale Cemetery and reinterred at Edison's Glenmont Estate. His New Jersey research lab and Glenmont are still preserved as part of the Edison National Historical Site. And that brings us to the end of the decade. Uh, 1880, the beginning of the next decade, there's going to be another uh, succession crisis uh, triggering this ethnic hatred between the, the Germans and the Irish uh, with regard to the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. But we will pause here and pick that up, uh, start a new series for the decade of the 1880s. So for now, thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned. <laughs>